walk in the spokesman for the King of Glory, Pastor Troy. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our God and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, as I understand it, you're in the middle of a series through the book of Acts called uh, Revolutionary Living. Uh, so, as it, as it turns out, I was pastoring for 19 years at a church called University Christian Church which is just a stone's throw from the University of Cincinnati. Uh, so we had a, a very similar situation near the university and also in the heart of the city. And one of the last sermon series that we worked through uh, before I left uh, the congregation at the end of January was a series through the book of Acts. Uh, so I wanted to share a few of the things that uh, really bubbled up in me and in our church uh, over last fall and share those with you uh, a bit today. Uh, I want to begin all the way back in Acts 1, just for a second. Uh, and it's important, at the beginning of Acts, it's, it's Jesus resurrected, spending time with his closest disciples that he had spent uh, the past three years with on a day-in, day-out basis. And now he has uh, lived a perfect life. He's died on the cross on the third day he rose again. And the Bible says he spent about 40 days with them, teaching them about the kingdom of God. Just trying to drill home for them uh, the things that he had wanted them to pass on to future uh, generations. That, that they are the ones who are going to be living out the great commission that Jesus describes at the end of Matthew. To go and make disciples of all nations of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus had commanded. So he is making sure they're clear on that. Very clear. At the end of Jesus, spending these 40 days, they get together uh, at, at the place where Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. And this begins in verse 6. So when they had come together, they, meaning the disciples, asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel. Is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? One of the challenges, one of the beliefs, one of the deeply ingrained notions that the disciples had is that Jesus' purpose was to restore Israel, to take it back to the days of David and Solomon, to make it a great nation, that Jesus was going to overthrow once and for all the oppression of the Roman Empire. So they thought that was what Jesus was going to do. The death kind of thrown for a loop, if you remember. They're all running away, confused. Well, now that Jesus is risen, is this the time that they're going to knock Rome out? And, and Jesus kind of patiently says, uh, it's not for you to know the times or periods the Father has set, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then Jesus ascends into heaven. <clears throat> One of the tensions going on in the book of Acts is that the disciples are all in on Jerusalem. They're excited about being witnesses in Jerusalem. They're pretty good with being witnesses in Judea. That includes Galilee, that includes Nazareth, that includes a place where the Jewish people were living. They were pretty good with that. Samaria, not so much. And then getting to the ends of the earth was the challenge. Remember back again in Matthew, you go and make disciples not just in Jerusalem, not just in Judea, in Judea. go and make disciples of all nations. Well, what you begin to see happen, I know you're about seven chapters into Acts now, is that they are really, they're cranking on all cylinders in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2, the, the day of Pentecost happens. Peter preaches that great sermon. The disciples and the apostles are able to speak to each in their own language. But even though there are lots of different languages, they're all god fears They're all aligned with Judaism in one way, shape, or form. And then out of the Jewish context and experience, 
They are making decisions to follow Jesus. On the first day, 3,000 uh, become part of the new church. And they share all things together in common. There's this beautiful picture in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42 and following, of what that early church was like, that they broke bread together in each other's homes, that they were fellowshipping, that they were praying, that they devoted themselves to the, to the apostles' teaching and to the teachings of Jesus. They're living out the, the, the Great Commission, uh, but they're doing it in a very centralized geographic location. One of the things that happens after some amazing continued growth and they stare down some of the Jewish leaders who tell them they're not allowed to talk about Jesus anymore and Peter basically says, well, we can't help but speak about the things we have seen and heard. Do to us what you will. And they were kind of dumbfounded and they're released and people are being healed, all sorts of amazing things. There's a, there's a section, I believe, in chapter 4 where they're praying together and the room shakes. There's so much power happening there. So they're getting the Jerusalem part, but then Stephen preaches this sermon, and I think as those of you who were here last week heard, Stephen ends up being, uh, being stoned to death for, for proclaiming Jesus Christ and challenging some of the notions of that day. And then a shift begins to happen after chapter 7. One of the people that was there when Stephen was stoned was a guy named Saul. And Saul's given a charge to go and start persecuting the church anywhere the church has gotten. Hasn't gotten far, but they want to contain it. Uh, and then we enter into, into the, some stories about Philip, and Philip has this encounter with an Ethiopian. And the Spirit tells him to share Jesus with an Ethiopian. Who knew that Jesus included in all the earth Ethiopians? But he shares that the Ethiopian is baptized and comes becomes a follower of Jesus. And then there's this experience of Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus. And, and Saul becomes part of this new kingdom and is given a particular mission that begins to play out as God is trying to push the people of God out of their comfort zone, push them out of where they have been into a new century, a new vision. Not restoring Israel, but being proclaimers of the kingdom of God, a place where God reigns, that is for each and every human being on the face of the earth, created in the image of God. And then Peter, who is uh, the Jew's Jew when it comes to being a follower of Jesus, has this encounter with a guy named Cornelius, who's not Jewish, and, and he doesn't understand, you really want me to share the good news of Jesus with someone who's not Jewish? And there's this tension. And then when he does it, he gets called back to Jerusalem, and the people of Jerusalem slap him on the wrist a little bit and say, what are you doing? Well, then we enter into chapter 11, and that's where I want to focus in a little bit. And by the way, those last three chapters I just buzzed through in about two minutes, I think will be walked through over the summer. So I'm just giving you a foretaste of chapters 8 through 10. But chapter 11, beginning in verse 19. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that took place over Stephen. So when Stephen is stoned to death, person, it's, he's not the only one suffering. A persecution visits the church. And the people of God, if they're not going to go just because Jesus said go to all the earth, they're going to go if their lives are in jeopardy. So they begin to spread out and scatter. And they go to Phoenicia, and they go to Cyprus, and they go to Antioch. And they spoke the word to no one except Jews. So they were going to parts of the Roman Empire that were not primarily Jewish, but they were containing their message only for the Jewish people. But there were a few rebels and radicals in their midst. Among them were some men of Cyprus and Cyrene who didn't get the memo. And on coming to Antioch, they spoke to the Hellenists, or the Greeks, or the Gentiles, or the non-Jewish folks. And they spoke to them also proclaiming the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number became believers and turned to the Lord. News of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. I almost picture word coming to the church in Jerusalem, and the, the, the leaders there in Jerusalem shaking their heads and having a really long meeting 
How do we get these Antiochians in line? Can you believe what they're doing? They're actually inviting non-Jewish people. Don't they know this is about restoring Israel? And so they decide, I know what we'll do. We'll send the enforcer out. We'll send Barnabas out to straighten things up. And he brings a message to try to get them in line. When he gets there, uh, we read that, that Barnabas came and saw the grace of God and he rejoiced. And he exhorted them to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast devotion, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, in a faith, and a great number of people, Jew and Gentile, were brought in to the kingdom of God. Something new happens in Antioch. Something new. One could argue that the first ten chapters of, of the book of Acts, Jerusalem is the center. But the last part of the book, Antioch becomes the center of what's going on. Look at this. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, who's just had a conversion experience. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. Saul, who becomes Paul, did not grow and mature and get nurtured in his faith in Jerusalem, but in Antioch. I think that's important. So it, so it was that for an entire year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. Something new has happened. Back several years ago, as, as Pastor Mike said, I spent quite a bit of time traveling back and forth to the Bay Area to uh, go to Stanford and work at the Martin Luther King Papers Project. And had a, the thrill of working with Dr. Clay Carson on one of the volumes that records uh, King's earliest sermons and religious writings and was able to do a dissertation and a book around Dr. King around that experience. But one of the things that I got to do in all those trips, I've probably made about 25 or 30 trips out here, is I got to know San Francisco a little bit and love the city and I love the Bay Area. And we had taken my oldest two children out when they were real little and did all the fun stuff like Alcatraz and Mere Woods and Exploratorium, all the good stuff for kids, had a great time. Uh, and, and then a few years ago, about six years ago, we came back out and, and I took my uh, oldest son, Jacob, and then my youngest daughter, Ellie, who you saw up here a minute ago. And we went to the Exploratorium and had a great time. And, and so when we came out this time, we were going up to uh, an experience of organizing a uh, staff retreat up north of Sacramento. We came in for a day before we started about a week ago to San Francisco area and we got settled into our hotel. And my 10 year old daughter Ellie had one first thing on our list of things to do when she got to San Francisco. And that was to go see the, the best sites featured in the opening theme song of Full House. Uh, so she's, she's discovered unfortunately that TV show and has watched uh, every episode like five times. And, and so we did our little tour. We went by the, the door in the little house they show in the opening scene. And we went over, I think it's called Alamo Park or something like that, and, and looked at the uh, Victorian homes overlooking the city. And, and while we were down in that section of the city, I noticed that we were near the marina, and I, I pointed to Ellie, hey, there's the Exploratorium. Maybe we can go check that out before we leave San Francisco. It's a great, and she kind of remembered it as a great science museum geared for children. So she was excited about that. So yesterday we get in the city and we had a great breakfast and, and uh, Jake was gonna go do his own thing and Ellie and I were going to the Exploratorium and I got out my Google Maps on my iPhone and started punching in the Exploratorium to get there in the most direct route. And, and I got the map and it seemed to skew. If you ever punched in an address or you you're trying to get somewhere, you think that the GPS is just not functioning on all cylinders, something's wrong. I punched it in three or four times, kept getting different options, uh, and it kept sending me to like Pier 18. It was the entirely wrong side of the Embarcadero. It was closer to the Bay Bridge instead of Golden Gate Bridge. And I knew it had been like four or five years since I'd been in the city, but something was wrong. I, I messed with my GPS on my iPhone for about 15 minutes until I just decided something must have changed with the Exploratorium. Uh, it would have been better for the story if I would have actually gone to the old building. But 
apparently within the last few months, I don't anybody know when, they moved the Exploratorium from this really cool red brick dome building over, uh, I guess, west of, of, uh, the, of the pier and Fisherman's Wharf. And they moved it all the way over to the other side and they took up a whole pier uh, over by the Bay Bridge side. And for 15 minutes I wrestled with it. Everything, it had all moved on. And I, I think there's, there's a sense in which what, part of what's going on in the book of Acts is there are people that had hung out with Jesus and had notions about what a Messiah would be. A notion of what the church would be. Those that were there for that launch on the day of Pentecost. What the church would be and how it would resurrect the Jewish people. And, and so they, they know where the Exploratorium is. And they're going to defend that. And they're going to make sure they keep calling people back to something that's not there anymore. And, and that's a lot of what's happening. They're, they're sending out people. They're sending out Barnabas. No, bring people back to the old Exploratorium. This is where we are. And they have this thing that they are protecting. And Jesus is saying, no, it's not about the kingdom of Israel. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about a new day. It's about a new adventure that I'm inviting you into. You all just spent 30 days without meats and sweets, right? On this Daniel fast. And the point of that is not just to change uh, your diet. Although I think we heard a testimony uh, first service where there was somebody lost some pounds, so there was some praise and some glory around that. So there are some residual benefits uh, to changing up your diet uh, for a month. But the real goal is to have some breakthroughs, to enter some new experiences, in a sense to remind ourselves uh, that, that we're going into a new exploratory, we're in a new era, there's a new center in our lives. And, and here's the deal, I, I heard testimonies in second service, there were testimonies earlier today during the uh, hour of power prayer time. There were testimonies of people who are experiencing new things, but the deal is, no matter who we are, there's going to be voices in our head. There are tracks that we play. There's a temptation to regress. When, when my daughter, who's now 10, gets tired, there's a three-year-old in there that comes out. When I get tired, <laughs> there could be a three. There's a temptation for us to regress. And I think that's true in our spiritual lives as well. There's some new things that maybe we've been introduced to, but we're going to keep one to, to buck where God is leading us and go back to what's comfortable or those notions. And that's why it's so important to be vigilant as individuals. And that's true for congregations. There are some patterns. You're only eight years old. Well, just shy of eight years old. But in those eight years, there's been some amazing things that have happened here. And I know some of the stories. I haven't gotten to know Pastor Mike and God has spent a lot of time with Antonio over the past couple years. There's some amazing things God is doing. And there's probably some times when it's tempting to go back yeah. and get into some patterns and get into some places that are not where God is calling the way church to be. And so that struggle is there. And that's true for the church in the United States. Um, one of the ways that God has been really reaching and stirring in the white evangelical church uh, over in some ways over the past decade is around justice. Uh, apparently, you can read uh, the 66 books of this Bible all the time and not notice God cares about justice. And if you doubt that, look at the 400 years of, of white Christian history in this country. I'm right now working on a co-authored book uh, with a multiracial uh, team of us with Zondervan Press. It's called Forgive Us. Confessions of a Compromised Faith. Yeah. And it's all the ways the church in the United States has failed in the public arena. And I have a deadline tonight on race and the way the church has failed around race. That's, that's hard to squeeze into one chapter. Uh, trust me. So I'm going to be a process of what to include and what not. Because it's an ugly history. But white evangelicals have begun to wake up a little bit to, ra to race and justice. But, you know, uh, a few years ago I went to uh, a mall in Cincinnati. And I'm, I'm not a mall guy by any way, shape, or form. I don't know if any of you are like me, but when, you go in, when I go into a mall, 
I start getting a little bit nervous, a little sweaty. You know the light's a little weird in there? We get to get depressed. My blood sugar goes down. I don't know. Um, I went in there only because it was the closest coffee shop was getting my car fixed. But I went in and I was on my way to get some coffee and I noticed a, a store named Justice. This was like five years ago. And I didn't know Justice had anything to do with law, so I was intrigued. I looked down from the sign and I was expecting to see some, some photos of maybe Dorothy Day, and Martin Luther King Jr., and Gandhi. All I saw was pastels. <laughs> I looked up again, I saw there's a little heart over the eye in Justice. And I saw a little side to side and it said, limited to, T-O-O, -O, limited to, is now Justice. Yeah. And limited and limited to is a women's, limited I think it's a women's clothing. Yeah. A uh, store that you'll find at your malls and limited to was the name they had for like the preteen crowd uh, so they could get on that pathway that I'm not sure what so <laughs> they now call it justice I, I really have no idea it's like four or five years now they've been calling it justice I have no idea why they call it justice and maybe somebody can inform me later but but they basically just rebranded. They're the same store, they just have a catchier name, right? And when I look at evangelical churches who have read books like, uh, my friend Shane wrote a book called Irresistible Revolution that talks about the need to call us to engage the poor and to, to live more simply. And he's spent time with Mother Teresa back in the day and he was in Iraq during the beginning of the first Iraq or the the Iraq War about uh, on the last 10 years ago now. Uh, but he has stories about what does it mean to engage in justice. A lot of people have read that stuff and, and understand we ought to care about the poor, but what they've done is said, okay, for the last 70 years, we've been doing mercy ministries. <clears throat> uh, on Thanksgiving Day, we deliver baskets of food to poor families. What if we, what if we rebrand that justice? with a little heart over the eye. And never ask any systemic questions about what's really going on in our society. And, and we are, why evangelicals are provoked around systems and structures, but we want to run back to the old exploratorium. We can do mercy, we can do charity, but justice, that is a little close to home because we've been benefiting for a very long time. tell just one story of where I've seen evangelicals get into a broad coalition in Cincinnati around systemic change and justice. It was about five years ago that I first uh, heard the story of Gene Mays. Gene Mays is an African-American man about my age in his mid-40s. Back in the late 80s, he was a star basketball player at Withrow High School in Cincinnati. And he had scholarship offers. He was a starting point guard. He had Division I scholarship offers to go play basketball. But one day in his senior year, after practice, he and some of his friends made a really stupid decision. I don't know if any of you made stupid decisions when you were 17 and 18. <laughs> made a really bad decision. They were, they were smoking marijuana in the parking lot. They got caught. And the school threw the book at it. It was back, get, get tough on drugs era for sure. And, and he got suspended. And word got out and he began to lose scholarship offers. And his 3.8 GPA began to tumble that senior year. And he ended up not going to college. And his opportunities were limited and he began to be depressed and he began to spiral down. He didn't, as an 18 year old, dream of being an addict. But that's the path he went down. He spiraled downward. And to feed his addiction, he began to traffic in drugs. And when you traffic in drugs during a period of a war on drugs, sooner or later you're going to get caught. And he got caught not once, but twice, but three times. Three times in the penitentiary. He finally gets out about 10 years ago in his early 30s. He's got a wife and children at this point. And he's, he, he describes walking down a street in Cincinnati about 11 p.m. looking for his next hit. And the best way he describes it is that 
that he just, it was clear to him, if I don't change now, I'm not going to live another year. I, I liken it to the story of the prodigal son when he's squandered all of his inheritance. And he's, he's so desperate that a Jew who's not to be anywhere near unclean things like pigs and pork is tending the pigs just to, just to get by and actually wishes that he had as much food as he was feeding the pigs. And there's this verse in there that basically says he came to himself. There's that point, there are many points like that for all of us in our journey, right? When we come to ourselves, the self that God created and redeemed us to be. That's part of why we do consecration months, by the way, is so we can come to ourselves and be reminded who we are and that Jesus loves us enough to die for us. Well, Gene Mays had one of those moments. He had a conversion moment. He had a road to Damascus moment. And, and he, from that point on, and this is like 10, 11, 12 years ago, has been entirely clean. He began to go on a long road. What does it mean for me to re-engage society and actually have a job that can provide for my family that isn't trafficking narcotics? Well, he got into an apprenticeship program. I think it was an electrician's apprenticeship program through the building trades in Cincinnati. And he's a really bright guy, and he excelled. It was a three-year program. He was top of his class for three straight years. And then he finally sat down and took the civil service exam for the city of Cincinnati. He got to pass that exam uh, to be able to work for the sewer district or other jobs in the, with the city of Cincinnati. Top score on the civil service exam back, I think it was about 2007, 2008. So he applies for the job with the sewer district. And he's given, he finds out he gets the job. And they, they go home late afternoon, and his kids are there, and his extended family is there, and his neighbors are there, and folks from his church are there. And they've got a cake, and they've got the balloons, and the music's going. And it's a party for Gene Mays, who's turned his life around. And any Christian would be thrilled about that, right? He's getting ready to sit down and have the cake. He gets a phone call from the city of Cincinnati, from the Civil Service Department. And and they say, hey, Gene, we just realized you have a felony conviction. And we can't give you this job. And the reality is, Gene Mays is not alone in that experience. Most, most felons may not get that far down the line. Most returning citizens, maybe there's a box you have to check. And you know you have a choice. Do I tell the truth and know I'll never get a call or an interview? Or do I lie and hope they don't figure it out? Because you know once you check that box, you're done. And we have a whole society and a whole church culture that preaches redemption and second chances and the lives can be turned around. And then as a society, we, we say no second chances. Not three strikes and you're out. One strike and you're out. One felony and you are done. Unless somebody cuts you a favor somewhere. At least that's how it's been in Ohio. In Ohio, 700 different sanctions of jobs you are illegally, you cannot do, if you're legally unable to do in Ohio if you have a felony. That includes getting a barber's license. That includes working in a hospital as a doctor, a nurse, an orderly, an intake person, a custodian, a cafeteria worker. I don't know about you, but in Ohio, one of the only growth industries is medicine, is the health professions. Our hospitals are tripling in size right now. All these new jobs, and everyone with a felony, which by the way, are disproportionately people of color, excluded, excluded, even when they turn their lives around. So we said, we gotta change this. And the city of Cincinnati said, we don't have a problem. And even if we did, the economy is way too bad right now to start offering jobs to returning citizens. And we said, well, we disagree. We got a bunch of evangelicals, the largest churches in Cincinnati, the largest white churches, joined with African-American churches and returning citizens together. 
and began to agitate and advocate for a fair hiring policy for the city of Cincinnati. And they didn't want us to do it. The mayor said, we do not have a problem. The mayor who had gotten sued, by the way, over the Gene Mays case. We don't have a problem. He didn't want to admit it. All the city council members, even the most progressive ones. I don't know if you ever run into progressive uh, folks in office who really are not willing to take any risks for fairness and justice. Well, we have some of that in, in Cincinnati. So they, they had, a, uh, they had a, a civil service board meeting and they were going to take public comments. And so we had 50 to 75 of us planning to go to the public comments and share stories because Gene May's story wasn't the only one. Well, the day they heard we were coming, so they called off. Right. They canceled public comments. Again, I doubt if that would ever happen in a place like Berkeley, but it happens in, in a place like Cincinnati. They, they, so, but we came anyway. And I was supposed to speak, and so I was, I was really agitated and aggravated and angry that day. We, we went up when they, right before they were going to close the meeting and said, we, we were told there would be public comments. You canceled it at the last minute. All we want is two minutes of your time. And there's a sheriff standing there right up next to me saying, you have to leave now or you're going to be arrested, which is always fun uh, situation. But I, I kept pushing it. We kept pushing it. Finally, I think the Civil Service Commission decided to de-escalate the situation. They said, you have two minutes. I got one minute of those two minutes. So I decided to just go through the Bible and start talking about all the felons in the Bible. <laughs> I, talked about, I talked about Moses who killed a man. I talked about Joseph who spent time in prison. I talked about Daniel in the lion's den. I talked about, uh, I talked about um, Jeremiah who was found in the bottom of a well because he was speaking a little much truth to power. I talked about Peter and Paul and all the disciples. I talked about Jesus. Jesus, who uh, ended up running into a little bit of trouble himself. And I basically says, I'd like to be, I'd like Cincinnati to be a place where Jesus could work if he was fighting for a job. <laughs> so we kept moving and moving and moving. And by the time they finally voted on it, they delayed and they delayed. But by August of 2010, six months after we started the campaign, uh, there was a nine to zero vote by city council for a fair hiring policy. The mayor, who said you don't have a problem, the day of the vote was talking about how great this was and how proud he was to be a part of it and that. Uh, and then we said, well, we gotta do something about these 700 barriers at the state level. So we began to organize, we talked to business people, we talked to, we organized, continue to organize returning citizens and churches went to state house and basically we have all Republican conservatives leading Ohio. Uh, but somehow through a moral narrative of second chance, we were able to get a new uh, uh, criminal justice bill through the House and Senate and the governor of Ohio last year. The vote in the House a year ago this month was 97 to 1 to provide more chances to give People who are turning their lives around, they can go and get a certificate of restitution. With that certificate, they can get a barber's license. They can work in a hospital. They can work in hundreds of fields and actually start contributing. And that's the direction we need to go. But here's the deal. Why do evangelicals are beginning to deal with this? We still have an exploratorium that we want to go back to. I don't know if you noticed that the Supreme Court was kind of busy this week. And uh, after Tuesday's ruling on Doma and gay marriage, a lot of controversy out there in the Christian community. I got tons of emails from white, conservative, evangelical friends of mine. Uh, tons of Facebook. You probably saw it all. The, 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 and there's a lot of work and, and thinking we need to do as the church and how to respond. But you know what I didn't hear any of? Was white, evangelical Christians decrying the rollback of the Voting Rights Act. Silence. Tone death. It's too controversial. Well, that Voting Rights Act has been one of the most powerful, liberating happenings of the last 50 years. And votes are in jeopardy because of this rollback. And every trick in the book is going to be, I see it in Ohio. Ohio matters just a little bit in presidential elections. Uh, we are the swing state of swing states. 
that bumped up my arm a little bit to last year. So we had, we had a, a, an election in 2010 for a juvenile court justice in Hamilton County, which is my home county in Cincinnati. And it was for a juvenile court justice, the first time ever that an African-American woman ran for the post. Republicans always win. She was within about 50 votes of winning. What we found out was <clears throat> that about 300 African Americans, so she lost by 50 votes on election night to the white Republican male. We found out that there were 300 votes that had been thrown out in African American precincts, where because to save money, I don't know if they do this here, they're combining a lot of precincts in the same building, and almost all the combining is in African American communities. Uh, and what had happened is people had gone in to vote, and the poll workers had told them to vote at the wrong precinct. And so their votes weren't being counted. When it became clear what had happened, uh, there was a lawsuit to try to get these votes counted. The city of Cincinnati, led by uh, the, 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 uh, the Board of Elections, actually spent about a million dollars over the next year and a half to try to keep those 300 votes from being counted by appeal after appeal after appeal. They spent my money to try to keep those 300 votes from being counted. And that's, that's racial injustice going on. White supremacy happening around the ballot box. And those battles, and finally, by the way, they cut a deal where the opponent of, of Tracy Hunter was appointed to a seat and Tracy was given the election, but only after the guy, the other guy in the race was given a safe landing spot did they actually drop their lawsuit. And now they're attacking Tracy Hunter every way they can to try to marginalize her, even as she's a duly elected court judge. There's still battles around this stuff today. And, and the church, though, is going to be tempted, the white church particularly, to continue to run back to the old exploratorium. And I don't know what that's going to be for you. Where are the places in your life you're going to be tempted to go back to? It reminds me of, of the book of Exodus when the people are finally out of bondage in Egypt and then they say, we want to go back to Egypt. We can't go back. There's a new exploratorium. Here's what's at stake. Here's what begins to happen when you have a new center. Chapter 13 of Acts. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger. Many think he was from Africa. Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a member of the court of Herod. So somebody who's tight with the Romans. And Saul. This is a multi-racial, multi-cultural, multi-ethnic kingdom of God present and alive in Antioch. And then what happens? They were worshiping the Lord and fasting. Maybe it was a day of the fast. I don't know. <laughs> Worship your Lord and fast. And the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. They were ascending church. The old exploratorium tries to rein people in. They have council after council. You'll be reading about councils in Jerusalem. Trying to figure out how to control the move of God. How to limit the move of God. But in Antioch, they're praying and they're fasting. And when it's time to send people out, they don't send the C team or the D team. They send Paul and Barnabas. And they send Paul, right? They go to Corinth. They go to Thessalonica. They go to, they go to Ephesus. They go to the, to the, uh, um, they go to the Philippians. They're going out and all the books that Paul writes are because of this move of God when they release people and the word of God reaches even Rome. Where in the last verse of the book of Acts, uh, the Bible says that, that Paul was in Rome preaching the, God without, preaching the kingdom of God without hindrance. And that's the opportunity if we allow Antioch to be our center and the kingdom of God to be our center. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray you would give us the strength and the discipline and the integrity and the courage to say no to the old exploratoriums in our lives, the old ways of thinking. Yes. Uh, Lord, you're always wanting to do new things with new wineskins. 
uh, God, in our churches, in our lives. Lord, we pray that you would reveal as, as uh, the way enters its eighth and ninth year of ministry that you would continue to open up for him, them what, the, what that new way, that new center needs to be for this congregation. Lord, may that be real in our lives. May we set aside uh, the things that get in our way and ensnare us and, and trip us up. And Lord, help us to fix our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Lead us forward in Jesus' name.